Hi and welcome back to the channel. If you've never been here before, I'm Sam and I took a VW Crafter and turned it into an off-grid adventure rig. Now we're upgrading the electrics in the back of the van. Currently in the middle of all that, didn't go to plan in the last video. If you haven't watched that, go back and have a look. But in this video, we're going to install the battery. We're going to install new cable, containment. And while we're going through it, I'm going to explain why we're using all these products. I'm going to show you how we make off a cable properly. And we're going to power up the system and see how it functions and runs. Not sure if this is round two or round three. Put it in the wrong way around. Put it in, it didn't fit. Right, this is round three. <laughs> we have the panel screwed in. It's stepped off at the back there. We've put multiple screws in the side there to hold that. That's screwed back to the fabric of the van. So it punches through that uh, three mil ply and into the, f the uh, webs on the van. So this is my battery delivery system. So yeah, we've had to adapt and conquer to make that the same height as where it's going. That weighs 48 kilos and there's no way I was going to fit that up there just with brute strength alone. Like a glove. And there you have it. The battery's in on its stand now. Secured with two orange straps. Reason for that is for going down any bumpy lanes or anything like that or involved in a crash. That battery's going nowhere. So when it comes to mounting the Phoenix inverter, it's very easy. There's a plate that sits about there. And basically you screw that to the wall, you hang this on it, and then in behind here, there are two screws that you mount, mount it to the wall with. There's also two at the top if you need to mount it. We've had this in place now for the best part of six weeks and it hasn't moved. So I've got every confidence that is mounted well and it's not going to cause us any problems in the future. A little bit of colour coordinating. We've got quite a few blue items in the back of the garage, so I thought I would add a couple more. One over there as well. It's done been been done earlier. So we got this from High Court off Amazon. This is the colour. It is a it is a good match on there, but what I've got in the van doesn't look like that i tried different primers it just doesn't work so the ral code you're looking for if you want a color match is 50 12. there you go don't know if you can see that but yeah mine's a little bit lighter than this but uh i've cut my losses it is what it is to make our installation look even more tidier we're going to use this stuff this is slotted trunking this is 80 by 80 and this is 40 by 40. The 80 by 80 we're going to use on the long runs with the big cables and the 40 by 40 we're going to use to supply equipment and to route cables out of the way. Now this is good stuff if you just need to pop out with a cable these just snap out and you can push them out wherever you want. If you take multiples out it still holds its strength it's still rigid. This is slotted trunking this allows any heat that builds up to dissipate keeping your system working efficiently if you want to buy this in blue be prepared this was about 28 quid for the 80 by 80 for a two meter length you'll be talking you'll be, you'll be looking i am not joking at double that price for blue trunking anyway the 40 by 40 this was about 12 pound a length all available from city electrical factors that's everything tidied up um, as much as I, I want to tidy up at the minute. So this was already installed. We've painted it blue to match them with all the other blue gear. Um, we've added split trunking to allow us to run the cables a little, more, a little bit neater and a little bit tidier. And when, when we finish, we'll put all these covers on and then we'll hide all that cabling. That just slips up there, covers all that. And that piece up the side will take the new supplies from the battery along and down. So the battery's there, so what we'll do is we'll put fuse carrier up on the wall there, an isolator, and then we'll drop into this trunking on the side and route the cables round and up onto the bottom of the inverter. I'm going to run through some of the equipment that I'm using and the tools that I use and why I use them. Um, just some simple things that you might not have considered but we'll save you money because when you start working with this big cable at 
20, 30 quid a metre, then little mistakes can become expensive really quickly. So I'll show you a couple of things that I do to stop them little mistakes from happening. And they do happen, <laughs> even I get caught out with them. But it's a couple of things I've learned while I've been uh, a sparky and just to try and save a bit of time, a bit of money. Well, the BMS on that battery is 250 amps. The recommended size of fusing for the cable and the cable size from Vitron is 95 mil and basically a 95 mil with a 400 amp fuse. So that's what we're going to install because I don't want to avoid any warranty on that. We're going to use a mega fuse. This is a 400 amp one. Hopefully you can see it there. Yeah. Mega fuse holder with split washers and that's for anti-vibration. So when we, we put the fuse on the bottom, up against that nut, split washer on top, and then we screw the nut down and the nut basically will bite onto that split. I don't know if you can see that. And compress it and that will stop them from vibrating loose. Next we have an isolator. This one has a good function where you can actually isolate it and remove the lock. Once it's off you can then put it back in, turn it and operate it. So if you wanted to work on that system and you knew you didn't want it turned back on or, or you wanted to leave it for a period of time, you can remove that knob and take it with you. So buying genuinely supplied parts is crucial for me. You'll see a lot of cheap stuff out there. This isolator is 30 quid. I got this one from Split Charge. This is a proper isolator. This won't snap when you're bolting things together. Some of the cheap ones out there that I've seen and come across over the years snap as soon as you try and put a, a decent sized cable in there. Again, split washers. And the base plate, don't forget the base plate because that offers you another layer of uh, insulation. The cable we're using is Hyflex 95mm squared. Ideal for what we're using it for. It does bend, gives you good radiuses. Um, so you can actually put it in the trunking that we're using and make some neat jobs out of it. Next we've got our copper tube um, lugs. Now this is a 95mm with a 10mm hole. So I'll accept a 95mm cable in that end and a 10mm hole there. This is an 8 so if you've ever struggled working out what's what, the 95 is the diameter of your cable and the 10 is the diameter of your hole. That simple. Something else to consider is the orientation of your lugs. Now, I've seen these, I've seen people make cables and then make them fit the installation. And that's not how it works. You make your cables to fit your installation, not the other way around. So look at that that there shows you how that is meant to sit basically they will go that way now when you come to use an isolator they're the opposite way around so it's hard to show you that so that's hmm, trying to there you go so that sits on the bottom again if you try to put it on the top it wouldn't it wouldn't sit right so we need to make sure that that and this, when we build our cables, both end up in the correct orientation. So that's the way they would sit. And that's why I've made this little link. And that goes from my isolator. And that will fit onto there, like so. I know there's a bit of a height difference, but when they're <laughs> flat on the ground, when you've got them laid out, there's no issue. There isn't. You, you just... Because it's high flex cable, we'll get all that to sit correctly. It'll find its own place. Don't worry. Getting these orientations correct is half the battle. That is half the battle. Because you do this right, and you'll not you'll not struggle. So I've got a 10mm hole this end, 8mm hole that end, because I'm going, there's an 8mm there, and a 10mm on that one. It is alright to mix and match 
your lugs as long as you're putting the right ones on the right end. Don't have too big a gap. I wouldn't put a 10 on an 8 um, because it's the contact area you're after. You really need to keep that contact area as much of a contact with the fuse as possible. So yeah, um, don't be drilling these out either. I don't agree with drilling these out. They're cheap enough, just go and buy what you need, get the right size, and you, you shouldn't go wrong. Buy a handful. <laughs> buy a handful of spares. Another thing I see a lot of people over tighten these. So these need to be around about 11 to 15 newton meters. Um, nothing more, nothing less. Tools. So this is my old favourite. This is a crimping tool that I've carried in my box of tools for many, many years. It goes from 6 right up to 25 mil. It allows us to crimp copper tube crimps all day long. I've been using this for 20 years. Absolutely brilliant bit of kit. I've only recently bought this one. I've always borrowed one in the past, but I thought it was time I took the plunge. I've ended up buying this one. So this one goes from 10 mil right up to 95. Perfect for this job. So anyway, we've bought that. I got it off uh, eBay for 60 quid. There was a guy selling it on there. But they're around about 180 pound. Um, maybe not something you'll go out and purchase, but I don't like them as that you hammer. I really don't. Um, there is some compression tools out there as well. They're okay, but if you're hammering something, you're shocking it. At least with these crimping tools, you're applying a regular steady force, constant force. You're just crimping, and that's what you should be doing. So you're not causing any damage to the strands on here. You're just compressing everything nice and slowly, and it all knits together. These are designed to go onto that cable and grip it tightly. So when we come to remove the outer sheath for the 95 to go on, the lug to go on, what we have inside there is a little lug, a little marker. So that's where we're going to measure up to. <laughs> this cable's so flexible. So what we're going to do is just trim off enough to push that right up. Don't take too much off because that's the last thing you want to do. So lightly score. Now it is quite soft this, and what you'll find is, if you scored it correctly, it should just open up, so we haven't gone deep enough, so just touch it with the blade, don't go hacking at it, and then push it through with your thumb, there you go, you can start to see copper now, now we've not touched any of that yet, so what we're doing is we're just bending it, and it'll come away. But the more you do this, over time, the more proficient you become. You don't even have to cut it, you just touch the blade and it will come away. And there you have it. Make sure all the strands are in line and get your lug and just slide it over the top. Now I always twist mine when I'm putting them on. If you look in there, you can see the copper right in the tip there. I'm happy with that, it's all the way home. It's that simple. So what you've got to do is line your lug up into there with the shoulder right up against this edge. And what you'll find is when you get the shoulder there, this will match up with the front of the lug and then it's just slow constant pressure no need to go any harder than I did there you can see in the back so when I say I punch in the back I always the flat surface on the lower side I always put my compression in there it looks nicer on the top and then what we do with this we will cut a sleeve and fit it over There you go, job done. On the other end, so the one we've made off, we have some masking tape. 
and I'm going to show you why we put masking tape on there. Right, this is a brake bar torque wrench. We've set it to 15 newton meters. There you go. So not not a lot of pressure on there. There you go. So that's them both talked up. Um, orientation's correct. So when I turn that, it'll be on, off, and pulled out. Job done. I've run the cables in, I've mocked them up. This is the route they're going to take down, under, and you can just barely make that out. There's two sets of terminals under there. And I've put a line down the front. That one I was a bit off on. This one here is okay. And that's so we can line the lugs up. Now, both of them cables need about, I would say, 10 mil trimmed off them to make them right. So that's what we'll do. We'll take 10 mil off the end of them and crimp them and then install them. The reason for mocking up the cables is because when you start running them in, into position, this cable will want to sit where it wants to sit and there's not a lot you can do about that but if you crimp your ends before you actually do this you could end up with this pointing sideways twisted um, not aligning and then you would have to go back and make this cable off again or you would be trying to force it into somewhere where it doesn't want to go putting pressure on the terminals which would over time probably end up fatiguing these once you get a bit of heat through the cables, they do settle down a little bit. But last thing we want is heat. <laughs> this is why we've rated these cables accordingly. So let's get them stripped out and made off. So the line is in line with the hooves. So now all we're going to do is crimp that and then fit it. So one final check before we crimp it, make sure it's all lined up. Job done. Look at that. Happy with that. Lines up with the holes. Spot on. Let's have a look at that. That one sat flat, that's the one we've just made off. So that's the end that is going onto the inverter. And that's the end for the battery. So if, we'd, if we had have made it standard and that would have been sat like that, that would have been wanting to twist one end or the other. So just applying a bit of pressure that we don't need. By doing it this way, that cable will sit perfect. Perfect. And there you have it. Job done. We've made the final connection now, which is a formula to flex into our changeover switch, and that will power our distribution board. Four mil is more than adequate for what we need. This is our chassis bond from the inverter, again, a 95 mil. We have a serrated washer that has broken through the paint. We've tested this for continuity, and it's there. Now, anybody that wants to twine about that bolt, twine away. It's steel, it's not brass, but I'm not bothered. It's fit for the environment, and I'm happy with it. Final piece to do tomorrow, which will be linking the fuse onto the terminal, and then we'll get all this tested. We deliberately chose the Vitron Phoenix inverter and the Fogstar Beast battery because they are the most powerful units on the market at this point in time. So the Phoenix inverter, 3000 watt, 12 volt, that's the biggest one, the biggest inverter Phoenix do at that voltage. The battery as well is the biggest battery, 608 amp hours of power, but that's not the whole story. That has a 250 amp BMS in it. 
so the JDB BMS will allow up to 250 amps out to power this unit we're not going to run the unit at its maximum but there may be occasions when we need all that power so having these two units combined is going to give us the most powerful system that we can get for a 12 volt system and that's why we went with it so the battery is amazing I, I love it if you had that in AGM in AGM batteries you'd be inundated with batteries you'd have you wouldn't have enough space for them to be honest and the weight would be horrendous that there weighs 48 kilos it's about the size of a battery a standard battery and a half um, I've put it in a void that wasn't being used above the wheel space and I can still get all the items in that I need to get in in that space so we have two tables we have a, a Kadak um, cook too I think they call it and we have our ground mat that we all fit that fit perfectly in that space we've installed the battery and we've used up some dead space now so I'm very happy going back to the battery though the BMS on that battery is a real good system um, it has a lot of protection built into it and that's what you want you want a BMS that is going to manage your battery look after it so you don't have to you still need to do checks on it you'll see you still need to check in on the on the app every now and then and the app is really good to use now if you struggle with apps and technology and stuff like that Foxstar have a group on Facebook and it's run by people um, that use Fogstar. So if you get stuck, drop on there. There's lots of people in there that will help you out. If you need any help with settings, there's lots of people on there that are knowledgeable. They're not keyboard warriors. They will help you out. They will keep you on the right path. And even Fogstar drop into that app and help out when required. So the BMS, it has overcharging protection. It has overcurrent protection. It has temperature protection under voltage protection and short circuit protection all built into it along with that it can settle balance so it can balance the cells as it's going along and keep them as equal as possible and and that's what you want from a good bms you want it to manage the battery for you now it also has a heating function now that heating function uses power that you introduce so be it your alternator or be it short power it uses that power to heat up the batteries so in cold temperatures it'll bring the cells up to a temperature where it's safe for them to be charged so if you're hovering around about zero degrees them heating pads will kick in they will bring the battery up to temperature and they will manage that charging for you so again it's looking after itself it's a smart system so that combined with that in my opinion is the perfect off-grid system now why didn't we go with a multi plus two we spend 95 percent of our time off-grid um <laughs> we hardly ever plug in if we're on a site and there's electric we'll take advantage of that like everybody else but it's very rare we go on sites um our camp outs we usually do off-grid um most of the places we go with our friends and and festivals we're off-grid so for me there's a big difference in price between this inverter and a multi plus two and it's around about four or five hundred quid that's better spent elsewhere so that's why we chose the smart inverter i understand why people use a smart two it uh, the multi plus two it is brilliant you plug in your shore power it chooses shore power you unplug or your shore power is interrupted it will seamlessly transfer onto battery without you even noticing so I understand why people use them but for me I can't see the point you know the multi plus two has a built-in charger as well but we can put a bigger charger in the system anytime we want and for a fraction of the cost so that's why we chose the inverter moment of truth so this is a point where I'd say about 99% of people really don't want to do the next step and that's turning on the isolator so <laughs> i have them days as well you you do all your dead checks you make sure that everything is as it should be everything's talked and everything's connected right and sized correctly but you've got to have confidence in your work and we've got to turn it on now just to be safe we don't want to energize anything beyond the inverter for now we just want to get the inverter working check the output on the inverter and then we can turn it all back off so we'll be doing that 
and our inverter isolator. This changeover switch allows us to decide where we supply our distribution board from. So it can be position one is inverter, position two is mains. This can also have our battery charger plugged into that side as well. Position zero means this is has no power at all coming to it and it has isolated this part of the system from where the power is generated. So I'm safe in the knowledge that there's no power going any further than the inverter. Okay, let's have a look in the app, see what's going on. To save a little bit of time, I've already done the firmware update. And as you can see, looking at that app, we are producing 230 volts. Got no load on it at the minute. It is in a state of inverting. Cool. Happy days. Right, let's drop out of that app. We don't need to do anything to the settings at the minute because we're not, we're not doing a lot. We're not, um, we're not powering anything at the minute. So let's just have a look at the app. So we're sat at 30%. We need to put this on charge, currently draw on 1.2, 1.3 amps and that's obviously what the inverter's taken because we've got nothing else connected to it. Happy days, everything's working as it should be. That's a win. So that 1.2 amps that's been consumed by the inverter is what's known as parasitic draw. So that is the power that is required by the inverter to change the voltage from 12 volt to 230. So if you ever hear that term, that's what it means. But if we had had solar fitted onto the van, and even on a, a rubbish day like today, it would, it would be negligible. You wouldn't see that parasitic draw because you would have at least a couple of amps coming in. It's always reassuring when you turn something on and it works first time as planned, as intended. So to straightforward install that, it is, a battery and inverter that's all we've done this weekend installed them two items bit of conduit moved a few things around tested everything make sure that it's working properly now i'm happy to proceed with the next step so the next step is we're going to install something that will charge the battery but i'm not going to put solar on yet i'm just going to install the orion excess dc to dc charger now that's a 12 volt charger that's powered by the alternator that delivers 50 amps. It's what everybody's raving about at the minute. It is one of the best innovations to come out in the last few months. Um, it's a smaller unit, produces less heat, and it packs a punch. 50 amps going into that 600 amp battery, plus whatever we generate from the solar when we do install it. So that's what we're going to do next. We're going to run that for a few weeks just on the DC to DC charger. And the reason behind that is we need to see how that system's gonna cope in the winter months because that's all we'll really have. We'll get the odd day where we get a little bit of solar, but the main thing for us in the winter is the DC to DC charger and how that is gonna support our new system. So if you've enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, share it with your friends. Any comments, just fire them in there at the bottom. But if you've got any questions, please, please ask them. We're here to help. This is what we're here and doing this for. And if you've enjoyed it, I'm happy. Anyway, we'll see you next Sunday. Thanks for watching. Why not head over and check out our new website, www.thecraftyblinders.co.uk. Make sure to follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and our Facebook group, The Crafty Blinder Van Builds. Thanks for watching.